What's up, guys? Welcome to PLM After Hours. This is episode six. All the way to my front is Rod. Rod, what's up, guys? What's up, guys? My name is Jaden, and then we have a special guest today. It's going to be Ricky Gutierrez on my right. What's going on, guys? Thank you again for having me. No, nah, thank you for coming, man. I know it's a long drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I drove all the way from Gilbert to Sedona. So happy to be here. <laughs> But good thing you brought the Prius, though, right? You brought the... the no, nah, I brought the G-Wagon. <laughs> what, what, what's the miles per gallon on that right now? Um, I, I didn't see, no. He don't check? He doesn't check. <laughs> That's, how, do you, how do you know you're doing well in life? I just don't check. <laughs> me, me, I'm watching it every trip. <laughs> <laughs> now, guys, uh, Ricky, thank you, man, for, for, for being here today. Uh, you know, we really appreciate you being here. Um, we think you're a very interesting guy. Your journey, your story, I can't wait to hear it. Um, it. I think everybody knows right now the Ricky with, you know, a million subs and YouTube, the Ricky with the Ferrari, with the Lambos, with, you know, the real estate company and all this, the stock trader. But tell us a little bit of how everything started, man. Like when be, even before that, right? Like what woke up this beast inside of you to say, all right, this is it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I've always had those three main focuses. So uh, real estate, cars, and then the stock market. That's kind of always something that's been... Um, an interest of mine and kind of for those that are unaware of who it is that I am. Uh, my name is Ricky. I originally uh, was born and raised in California up until 2015. I decided to move out to go to the ASU Polytechnic campus. Um, and I kind of just dropped everything I told my parents, I think like two weeks prior. Mm -hmm. And I made the move. They didn't even believe I was going to leave. I <laughs> packed up. I had a, a Genesis coupe. I packed wow. up all my things. I mean, everything fit there. I didn't really have much. I moved on over to ASU. I didn't even have a dorm to stay. I mean, I, I it was orientation day. So they set me up at one of the barracks at first. So like uh -huh. ASU Poly has like those old barracks. And I lived there for about six months. Uh, I didn't have any friends. And one of the things that I really appreciate appreciated about my experiences. I originally wanted to go to ASU because they were a party school. Uh, it, it <laughs> I was think like, everybody, that ASU yeah. was a party. Right yeah, I mean, I used to watch the I'm Schmacked videos and back then, I mean, they're, they're not out anymore, but uh, they would have this like Halloween fest and there's these like hot girls and there's these <laughs> parties. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest, like that's one of my motivations of what sparked my interest in wanting to go to Arizona State University. It wasn't the sun, the heat. <laughs> no, de definitely not. It was that. Um, it was like being able to come uh, to a different state where, again, I, it was this. It looked like this experience I've never seen before. Right. And then on top of that, I knew that the cost of living was a lot less in Arizona. Oh, yeah. So that was my motivation. I moved out here. I went to the ASU Poly campus. I didn't know to know that where all the parties were at was the Tempe <laughs> campus. So it went from wanting to go party all the time, or that was like my original motivator to making the transition from California to Arizona. I really put myself in an environment where I knew no one yeah. and it was honestly like a blessing in disguise because I was able to choose who it is that I was kind of here. Like a, you know, like a fresh start. You know it's a fresh start and it was a, a controlled environment. Now every friend that I make and every person that I choose to surround myself with is a person that I will then most likely be someone that I want in my life. And that's right. very hard to do when you're in your hometown, right? You often see people not really excel and or continue to get stuck in that same routine, which is something that we hear so often. So I think that if you're someone that's have that has ever considered of moving away from your hometown because you feel restricted and or you have a lack of motivation, I think putting yourself in a completely new environment, at least in my experience, was something that really allowed me to have no distractions. Right. All I did was I worked, I went to school, and I made videos on YouTube. That's my first true. three videos was buying my first house at age 20. My second video was I loved buying and reselling cars. Right. So I made a video of going to like a Ford dealership trying to buy a Ford Mustang. And then my third video was I made like $113 off of a lower cap stock. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started my journey. That's I crazy. agree with you. And uh, just so people know, and also so you know, um, I've been watching you for a while since high school days and whatnot for, from when I was in high school. And uh Seeing you go from uh, in Arizona and hearing your story before on YouTube and whatnot that you left from California. I'm originally from California as well. And that was a huge motivation for me to go out to here too and go to GCU. So That's just a little backstory, dude. <laughs> just say you, you, you have inspired people. You inspired people, me you know? as well. I appreciate that. And I mean, I think that's the big thing where... I have my info based videos, which are, you know, the boring ones where I perform technical analysis or depending on what markets I'm talking about, those are boring, right? 
But then I also have my other videos where uh, they're, they're the day in lives. Like those are meant to like really motivate to our next generation. And like his thing where it's just one video that really sparked his interest to kind of just, it sparked an idea that he later entertained, right? right? At the end of the day, we're here to simply spark an interest. And that's all that this content is for. It's still on you to hold yourself accountable and follow right. through with, you know, proper action. Yeah. yeah. And that's cool, dude. Like, I mean, how old were you at the time? And and how did you break that fear or did you have any fear at any time saying okay i'm gonna move out of you know to a complete different state um how long did you think about doing that move making that move the the move was not the the concern for me the concern for me was i mean i i always lived with my parents and then i went for a summer to go visit my brother in san diego and seeing how much as an individual I grew, not being in this little bubble that I was like kind of raised in, uh, I developed a lot as an individual. And I was like, this was only two to three months. I was like, I, I think that this environment was good. I, I began to grow a little bit more of my personality. Some was taken from my brother, some was taken from his friends that he would hang out with. And I just, I felt more active. I felt more of you know, an individual. Right. Uh, so when I went back home and I visited for about a month or I was staying there for about a month, I made the decision where I was like, I'm just going to move. Mm -hmm. uh, within that month, I remember looking at properties. Um, at the time I was working for those that are unaware, um, I was working in telecommunication sales based jobs. So I was working for T-Mobile. Okay. Um, I was a part-time employee and from 18 to 19 to 20, I was making a good stable income where I was, it was commission based and I was making anywhere from 55 K to nearly 70 K a year. And as an 18 year old, I, mean, I lived at home. Yeah. I had no expenses. I would save all of my money. Uh, it didn't take very long for me to, you know, allocate a good amount of capital where I knew that I, I would most likely be able to qualify for a house, right. but in California, like what house am I going to buy for $180,000? Oh, yeah, no, when I was looking for properties in Arizona, dude, properties in Gilbert on average were like 150 to 180,000. Well, Gilbert wasn't as big as it is today. Correct. So it was very small. And there's one thing that I looked up. I looked up fastest growing cities in Arizona and Gilbert was number one it was the top five fastest growing city in the United States. Yeah. I, I want to say that, again, sure, a lot of, you know, I, I was taking action. I, I was choosing to do these different things that put me in the position that I am today. But a lot of it did have to do with timing oh, yeah. where, you know, if I would have tried to make that move, let's say that 20 year old rookie is or was 20 years old now market conditions are pretty shitty. Yeah. Right. Markets be, are it's really hard for a 20 year old right now to buy Dude, I mean, my, my same house that I bought for $176,000 is now worth $550,000. It's a three-bedroom, 1,500 square feet. It's in a, a huge expanding area. That house I, I will keep probably for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and it's it's crazy. Like, yeah, it is kind of scary of like, wow, it is challenging for a very young individual to be able to afford a house. But also now with everything that is being put in place, it's never been easier to make right. money. So it, 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 that's, that's it's, it's a that give and take. Said. That's yeah. something that I've always said from especially 2021, I said even after like the COVID thing was yeah. kind of settling, it was it's so easy to make money. Yeah. And a lot of money. Yeah. You know, back then, I used to do piece work for $50 a day, $80 a day, working yeah. almost all day. Yeah. Right now, you you talk to a construction worker, they won't want to go outside for under $250, $300 a Dude, day. Dude, yeah, I mean, for the house flips, the yeah. contractors are expensive. <laughs> uh, yeah. building, building material, building cost is really high right now. Everything, yeah. yeah. So there's the pros and there's the cons. And again, uh, there will always be people that find an excuse of why not to pursue or, you know, maybe a better life or a life worth living. And at the end of the day, it really just depends on how bad you want it. So you've always been like a, you know, pretty much always really grinded and hustled hard. Um, I know that your main thing is trading, right? Correct. But you recently got into real estate. and But before that, I know you just mentioned something with the cars. You, you kind of entertained the, the, the idea of buying and selling cars. I know up to now, you always change cars. You buy cars. You're always trying to find good deals. And you most of the time make money. I know that personally. Yeah. So, so you made money off of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't sold it. I'm, oh, I'm actually, Audi. the Audi R8, yeah. No, it happens. It, you know, it's business. It's a good deal. Yeah. Um, but 
what happened with like the whole card thing? You didn't pr- pursue it more, or you just said, okay, I'm just gonna focus more on trading for now. I, I did. I, I think you know the idea of um, it was opportunity cost um, stock market um, and trading in the stock market, investing in the stock market. It was just a very lucrative time. That's where all my time and attention was. But I was still buying and selling motorcycles and cars. So this way. day, you're always looking for deals. Correct. Um, I've now transitioned where, I don't even know if you know this, but um, I have my buddy Weston, who uh, moved from Arkansas to Arizona, and he was a car reseller. Mm-hmm. Uh, he visited us once, and he re- meshed really well with our group back in 2018. He visited one more time during his birthday, and then I asked him if he wanted to move in with us. He mm-hmm. dropped out of college, he moved on over here. And then two years later during the pandemic uh, with Caleb Webb, which is also a random follower that I met that lived in Gilbert, there were two car guys I used to fund their car flips. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want them to use any of their money. I said, I will pay for it all and we'll we'll do a rep split. So instead of me doing it, I would give them money, we'll come up with a rep split that was in their benefit, but I would be able to film content with it. That was more of value for me. Um, And then from there, it got to a point where during the pandemic, there was an opportunity where this piece of land came about and that's where Carson and Moore started. So Caleb and Weston started a dealership. I funded it. And then they opened their second location in BB, Arkansas, and now their third location in Searcy. Wow, so nice. I'm just the investor yeah. behind it. Um, and, and the, the and one that, here in Arizona is in... Uh, Mesa. In Mesa. Okay. Yeah, right off of Power and Wilmington, but it's lower end cars. It's They focus on buy here, pay here, and... Um, just it's entry level vehicles. Entry level vehicles, yeah. yeah. Those are good, man. I used to do those back in the day. They were really good. They, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, profit wise, it's not much of a difference. A lot of people think, oh, that you know, you sell uh, ninety, eighty thousand dollars cars, and they somehow think, oh, I'm gonna make ten, fifteen grand on them. Honestly, the profit margins are not much different. I, I think right, it's all relative to scale. You have you have some of those that you hit those home runs. Yeah, you have right? opportunities, of course. Um, but they have with the lower capital or with the lower dollar vehicles, at least in my experience. Um, yeah, it's easier to go from a two thousand dollar vehicle and then being able to sell it for you know thirty five hundred and percentage of cash on cash return. Yeah, that's very lucrative. Yeah. But also, you how make, many am I going to have to flip? 50%. Yeah, yeah, but how many am I going to have to flip to eventually make thirty thousand? Right. Where you know with two luxury flips, I can do the same thing. Right. right? Going, going back a little bit um, with you at ASU, did you graduate from there? Or no. You... Don't call me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. I just said so this party. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> I dropped out my senior year. Um, it was something that I took very seriously. Everyone else was like, dude, you don't need school. Like even my one of my professors um, in my, I mean, I was going for school for entrepreneurship. Okay. So therefore like after you graduate, like <laughs> the intention is to start yeah. a business, right? <laughs> so why not uh, start now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I remember t- uh, bringing the idea. I mean, when I was going to school and I was still working, I when I had a job over here, I was working at Verizon Wireless. I was 21 or 22 at the time, and I was going to school full-time. I was trading full-time, uploading videos full-time at the time, and I was also working full-time. Um, I mean, it got to the point where I almost didn't go to class anymore, but my professors knew what it was that I was doing, so they would assist me. They would allow me to show up for the test, and I was very good at taking tests last minute, and I would just, you know, study and I would do well, I would pass the classes, but it got to a point where everything just became too hectic in the sense that I'm a big believer in opportunity cost. It wasn't that I wanted to quit my job because I don't need the money anymore. It's never been about, I don't need the money. It's Mm -hmm. if I'm going to quit my job and I'm working there full time and I allocate eight hours, five days a week there, it's not about that. I want to watch Netflix for those eight hours. It's what is it that I'm going to be doing for those eight hours that now is more of an opportunity than the revenue that I was making throughout that job? And then when an opportunity like that did present itself, I can therefore then justify leaving that job so I can then obsess and make more money in another area. But it wasn't because I wanted to take more time off. It was always because I, I saw a greater opportunity elsewhere. So I would have to drop something as, you know, everyone just has 24 hours yeah. within right. a day, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was working there and I was 22 years old. I was pulling up at a Corvette Z06 2015 and a 2012 McLaren MP4 12C. And I'd pull up to working at Verizon with yeah. my little button up there and I'd pull up to class the same way. And I, I never cared about, people were like, why are you even working here? I was like, it's not about it was never, never, never about the money. It was on an opportunity that was greater than what I was making there. I was like, I, 
I would then make that decision. But I knew the money that I was making there. I was very grateful for it. It was great money for the work that I was doing. And I didn't want to feel like in, entitled or put myself on a pedestal where I'm too good to work. It's right. never been about that for me. Yeah. And to, uh, to our viewers, I know just I'm doing school full time right now and working here full time. You did a lot of things full time, you know, four or five of them. How'd you do with time management and all that? Like, what was your, your biggest key to, to keeping your sanity as you That's you a lot of, it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of consistency, just. Yeah, it, it was, dude, I enjoyed it. I wish I had like a super motivational th way of like, <laughs> you know, like I. Just, you're passionate I, about those things. So. I loved trading. Yeah. I know that I needed to work. I'm big on having a stable income. Um, when it came down to my videos, I really enjoyed other people seeing value in the content that I was creating. And I became obsessive about that, where the consistency and the discipline was just, it wasn't even a question. It wasn't mm -hmm. a question if I was going to upload a video. Like when I wake up every morning, it's not a question of, oh my God, I have to wake up at 6.30 every morning to go live every day. It's like, I'm, I'm in such a blessed and fortunate position that if I don't do it, someone else will work harder right. and replace me. Yeah. Right. And I think it's as simple as that. It simply comes down to how bad you want it because anyone can come up with any excuse on why not to do something. It's just up to you on what you value most. Yeah, absolutely. That's man. That's nice. I know you mentioned you had like the Z06, the McLaren. So you've always yeah. been a car guy. Dude, yeah. I, I kind of know what cars you have now, but what, what's like your kind of like your collection right now that you have? So I have a 2020 Ferrari F8. Jeez. I have a <laughs> 2020 Twin Turbo Evo. Yeah. I have a G Wagon I purchased through Phoenix Legit Motor Group. <laughs> I have a 2022 uh, Tesla Model X Plaid that I bought Those for are my fast, huh? baby mama. Yeah, <laughs> she hates when I call her that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I have a Toyota Tacoma. I have a 2004 Toyota Tacoma, so I would use that to like transport things. I have a. Hmm. That's well, gold right there. That Tacoma's gold. If you know yeah, cars, uh, that Tacoma's yeah. gold. I was, I was raised with the idea of my dad every time that we'd see a Toyota Tacoma. He's like, those are the best trucks oh, ever. Yeah. He's like, mijo, those are the best ones. Anytime yeah. you see those, just buy them. So I bought it for 6000 and now it's worth like ten or something. Take right? it to Hawaii. That's 35000 in Hawaii. <laughs> Dude, Hawaii <laughs> Tacomas, they're the best. Th that year Tacoma is right. like the best out there. I love that. And That's then great. I have a 2018 Ford Mustang twin turbo. Twin turbo. That, a yeah. burger, it's like a... Like a burgundy, -ish. yeah, great, it's like a color kind of a burgundy one. Yeah. I feel like that's a good that's a good um, name for it. And then yeah. I have a little cannon. Oh yeah, yeah. so that's badass, dude. How you have like your own little collection and all that. Yeah. So, um, how hard was it to build, you know, your million something subscribers on YouTube to keep that stable? Mm -hmm. well, it's never been stable, right? So I've I've had moments where like we absolutely explode, and I have had moments where we lack growth. I, I think just like any business, like, again, I never started uploading videos on YouTube for the intent for making money. I've never uploaded videos because I needed something. I mean, it sets a standard and that standard is something that we've experienced before. So it motivates us to know what is possible. But when you don't have an expectation or a need to make money, when you don't make as much as you've made before in that, you know, hobby or side hustle, mm -hmm. It doesn't discourage me to stop. It right. just yeah. pushes me and motivates me to try to find a more creative way to deliver or express a message. And, and, and a lot, I know you said earlier, you do it to kind of like what you did, you know, with Jaden, motivate, kind of leave a message out there and kind of, you know, say, hey, there is a way to do it. You Definitely. Know? And, you know, by being able to see, I mean, it took me from 2015, from when I uploaded the end of 2015 to upload my first video of uh, buying my first house at age 20 to now I'm, I'm still barely over a million. And yeah. what is that? Seven years later, it's where well, there's people that grow to zero to a million in you know, a couple of months now. Right. Yeah. So but I feel like most of the growth there is like people doing like either stupid things or yeah, know, there's a virality like, aspect and, and some are good, some yeah, are bad. Some, right. Yeah, um, sure. I, I think the biggest thing that has really motivated us to continue to do it is um, our intention and our intentions have never changed our um, experience and fulfillment that we gain from other people seeing value in either our content and or being motivated um, just like he was saying it's that's all i need i i have never cared enough of like hey my revenue is down 50 percent right. or this person's making more than me i i am not someone that gets jealous and or holds a grudge or, or views other people as Competition, competition really I, I view it more as in like 
Uh, when I see someone doing better, I'm like, damn, I thought I was doing well. They just raise the standard to know of what is possible. Right. And for right. me, I would rather view competition that way than to take it as something personal and or that their success is something that takes away from mine. Or that I, you should have it. Or, yeah, it's yeah I feel love. like everything that everyone earns in life is earned it's not deserved right and right. just as quick as i've earned it it can be taken away right. if i you know lack the discipline or the consistency yeah and i think that shows because i mean there's a lot of people out there that have their own you know financial courses trading courses and things like that and there's a lot of you, you'll look through the comments on the ads and everyone's just like oh they're just money hungry you know trying to get everyone i've never seen anything of that with you i've always seen you know just positive and i think people can see through the camera what your true intentions are I, I think it goes hand in hand where, I mean, regardless of any space that you're in, any time that you have some form of paywall and they already see that you're doing well, automatically it's going to, um, I would say, bother some people because to them, if you're already doing well, the standard that they think that someone should be okay with, they try to hold you to that same standard. But just because you're okay with $100,000 a year or a million dollars a year does not mean that that's what I view as my standard. When I see that I can make multiple seven figures or even eight figures, why would I hold myself to a standard to please someone else, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think once you've been in the space and I've seen what is possible, it is very easy for me to see that it's not even about the money anymore. The money is just the byproduct of what it is that we create, um, which I'm very grateful for, but I love the challenge. I don't need to be flipping houses, but I right. love the idea of we created a seven figure business annually of being able to flip houses. And what business do I have flipping houses? It's, I knew nothing about it's it. It's right? more like of what you could achieve. Like it's, what can it's, I do? Could we make it happen? Could yeah. I build a partnership with someone to get it to a point where it can generate this type of revenue? And that's, that's the way that I've always looked at, you know, when I had my two friends come up to me about the idea of starting a car dealership. I don't need the money, right? Yeah. It was just more of like, shoot, let's try it. Yeah. Can I? I? Can yeah, I? Can, can I? I? We started our little e-commerce brand for Dude, selling mouse pads. What fucking business do I have <laughs> I selling have mouse pads? <laughs> yeah, but it's true. It's like, what business do I have yeah. selling mouse pads? Like, I'm not a designer. It's it's just like, oh, there's there's this outlet where I could provide or be a value for someone because of my space. Why not create it? And I partnered up with one of my buddies. He's much more talented in that area than I am. And naturally, organically, without even running ads, that business does multiple six figures a year. And yeah. it started by knowing nothing but learning along the way. Again, you never know until you try. And, and I think finding, in this world, finding the 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 right people to partner up with. You know, yeah, really. that and that, that's always going to be a big challenge for a lot of people. Where um, one of the big pieces of advice that I can have for anyone is the reason I feel like I've experienced success in these different right avenues as you know, the car dealership and what comes out to the e-commerce or the house flips or even just our YouTube channels. There's rev splits along the way, right? And at some point or another, everyone is always so obsessive about or if they don't feel like they're being compensated enough for what it is that they're doing, they feel undervalued. And that's one right. thing that I've learned where I want to work with someone where they compliment me. I'm the guy that has either the following and or the money. Yeah. Right. So this person better be more talented than me in that space to compliment me because if we both have money, then that doesn't compliment one another yeah. where yeah. we're providing no value for one another. So with Nick, Nick was just way better than me at analyzing real estate deals. He's just obsessive about it the same way that I am with the stock market. And because of that, I knew that he would make a good partner. Right. We set proper expectations. We have those difficult conversations up front. I want him to feel valued. I ask him what he, he needs, and I want to make sure that I feel valued, and I set guidelines for that. The same thing happened with our e-commerce store. The same thing happened with even uh, the media side of things. With When Michael originally started filming content for us, it's, why do I need to hire a filmer and editor? Like, why why do you hire him, right? Mm -hmm. He is more talented in an area that you lack. And some people are so egotistical that they're like, you heard no, it, 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 <laughs> he challenges me sometimes. We always so argue, but, yeah, but that's good. Yeah, and, 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 I mean, I am not a good filmer editor, but if I do have a, a standard based off of what I see or what I know is possible, and my job is to push you as a partner and or as a boss to a level that even you didn't know that you know possibly, you could yeah. be pushed to yeah. um, and i think that's where you complement one another where you are of value to one another because you indirectly make one another or directly make one another 
better, yeah, right? right? That's crazy, dude. With seeing how successful you've been in the trading, right? I would think that you came from, like, you know, your family was maybe in that, doing that as well. Like, yeah. trading, that's at that, first. That's an assumption I get very often. Right, at, at first, yeah, because you see success, right? And yeah. I feel like I'm not the type of person to just find, like, oh, well, it was easy for him or whatever. No, but what I'm saying is if he's this good, I'm pretty sure, you know, he probably grew into it and then he just evolved even more yeah. into it. But that's great. Now that I hear your story, it's even more inspiring, you know, knowing that you kind of started on. Do you know own. what my dad does? No. No? So my dad is a handyman. So mm -hmm. my dad uh, lays down tile. Okay. And I think it's it's uh, because I came from that background. So both of my parents are Hispanic. My mom's a stay-at-home mom. That's, what, that's about the Gutierrez. Yeah. So my mom's also Hispanic. So okay. stay-at-home mom. Both of them are from Mexico. My dad um, had his uh, tile business. And then one of the things that really put things into perspective when I got on the social media space is I always had a strong work ethic because of him. Right. And when I got into the social media space, people were so entitled. They were so unwilling to want to work or make things happen because they felt that they deserved more pay or they don't want to collab with someone because they have more followers. I was like, right. dude, I don't give a fuck. I was like, I came from working with my it, dad it on the weekend. It today that you're here with us, really. I mean, from a million subscribers to somebody that we're on episode six. You know yeah, I mean? so but, that's what, yeah. like that says a lot about you. you know yeah, I mean? and and again, I think a lot of it just has to do with like when you really put things into perspective. Where even the guys that we have working at our house flips, like those are are hardworking individuals. My days might be hard. My days might be challenging. My days might be long, but it is never a twelve hour to sixteen hour shift on my back. You know lifting up tile or doing the type of things that my dad did You've so many times that i yeah I, i've seen it and i've i, I want to say that i've done that but i was like eight years old and most of the time i'd spend in my dad's van putting tape around a town yeah. making cell phones or something right. <laughs> um and i just by seeing it firsthand i've always been very appreciative of like the opportunities that i've been presented while other people are so consumed in the idea of how many followers someone has i'm great that grateful that i'm able to leverage that to, uh you know I can, I can meet people and or I get treated a specific way because right. of what they view me as. Dude, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just, it's, I just, I've done things in life that enough people follow me or find interesting, but I, I know that I'm, I'm just a number, right? right? It's just, just like I have a number of followers. Like I am one of potentially millions of people that have, you know, a couple hundred thousand right. followers or a couple million right. followers. And um, I think there's three ways on how to provide or be a value for individuals. The first way is based off of information that you can provide. The second way is based off of accessibility. So if I can make myself more accessible than you, yeah, you might be more successful. Yeah, you might be better at what you do. But if I make myself more accessible, then I can therefore be hopefully more of value to someone that's just getting started. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing is, I think, with entertainment, right? That's yeah. how you can become value or of value to someone where you entertain them to the point where they will follow you and or want to be around you because you are simply someone that is fun or entertaining to be around. So I think when you understand that, it's um, it's very easy to then begin to see how you can then become a value for whoever it is that you want to be. Absolutely. Guys, we have to take a quick little commercial break right here, but we'll be right back for you guys in no time. All right, guys, we're back. Um, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, I'm pretty sure you get this question asked a lot. Um, how much did you first start off with? Yeah, so when it comes down to trading, I started with $2,500. And one of the things that I love to talk about is uh, a lot of people think that when they're just getting into the stock market, it's, it's again, it's almost ego-driven where people begin to do very well and, and um, they're like, oh, I have 50,000 that's disposable that I want to start off with or 100,000 or I feel like they try to impress me or, or try to prove themselves that they have a specific dollar amount. And I first compliment them because I always, I never want to come off as like, I don't care. My biggest thing is I try to compliment them of like, well, it's great that you saved that great amount of money because it is great, right? But on top of that, one thing that you need to understand is that, you know, when you go to try to become an engineer and you go to college, do you expect to make money your first semester in college? No, I mean, it takes time to gain experience and to learn from your mistakes. So this is why I think that it's best to whatever it is that you think that you're okay with starting to learn how to trade, to like take 10% of that. And I really do mean that where you should be empowered, in my opinion, to trade small. Because if you trade small and as you're just getting started, you're going to make numerous mistakes. Right. So by trading small, you lose small. 
And the biggest thing that you don't want to do is to discourage yourself. And it's, yeah, I could have traded with a lot more money than $2,500, but even at that point, I was still blowing through my trading account and making numerous mistakes where if I would have started with $10,000, I mean, at that point, that's four accounts I could have funded in a much more effective way. So again, the biggest thing that you want to do is ask yourself, what is your intention by learning how to trade? And it's to learn. So why not focus on the learning and the making money part comes later. It's just like starting a business. Yeah, Yeah, that's really smart. A lot of people do want to just start big. And I feel like they would quit maybe because they see small numbers and profits. Yeah. You know, for example, if someone has, let's just say 50,000, right, saved up and they said, okay, I want to start. Obviously, they say they were to start with you at 2,500. Yeah. They're they're only going to see, they're not going to see crazy amount in profits and they're kind of, gonna get discouraged 100 percent. i mean i i try to use myself as, as an example where i post my reels and i talk about the dollar amount that i make right of like let's say i make twenty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars within a day it sounds like an outrageous amount of money but i also disclose how much i'm trading with i right. trade with half a million dollars yeah. so if you think about it percentage wise have you ever had a four percent day and i made a reel like this where i was like what sounds more pre- impressive a four percent day or a twenty thousand dollar day Four percent day. If I asked you or told you that I just had that, you'd be like, "Okay, I don't care." Yeah. Right. I, you're like, I, "I've had that before," or "I know I can do that." Yeah. Well, that's all it is, right? Yeah. It's all relative to scale. You start small to prove yourself that you can be consistent and do and hit this number over a long period of time. So then, when you begin to gain experience and gain confidence, you can do it with 10x. So the biggest thing that you don't want to do is to discourage yourself. So why are you trying to make it or break it trading with the most amount of money? And trying to make the most amount of money then when you're not even trading with what you can be trading with five years ago. Have you seen people lose it all or, you know, Dude, yeah, especially during the whole AMC movement. I mean, I made. (laughs) Did you trade during the AMC thing? Uh, I did not do um, AMC because I just, I was too afraid. Like, AMC was going crazy. Yeah, and I I think a lot of it just has to do with um, it brought a lot of attention to the stock market, which was great. But if you look at the videos that I would upload during that time, all I was, I was going against the market in the sense that I wasn't not trading it. But all I said is I would close out my day trade every single day. It's like, no, like you can't be doing that. Like this thing's going to go to the moon. It's just a bunch of people that have never traded before. They have no experience and they're being told something through Reddit. And there's just so many videos being posted, reels, you know, from other people that are. Where it's just, it's going to go to a thousand. Right. It's going to go to 10,000. I was like, I've never seen anything like that happen where. Sure, if that's what you think, great. But my focus is the only way that you can make money in the stock market is if you can control how much money you give back. And that's why I focused on closing out my trade every day because whatever it is of how much I made, even if that stock gapped up or gapped down, I would take no part. When an opportunity would present itself, I would take action. And again, that's the biggest thing where all those people that made or tried to make a ton of money on the way up, most likely bag held all the way back down and now are at a net loss. Or if you would have just not been so greedy and focused on understanding what it was that you were doing. Right. I've had numerous people that from my videos, or I would film a video every day because it obviously got a lot of attention of like, these are not stocks you want to hold. It's just that simple. Like they're BS companies. They're a reason that there's they were so heavily shorted. Where they first, numerous people were getting super pissed. They're like, you're just spreading FUD, which is like that I'm trying to instill fear in people. Mm-hmm. And then they come back five to 12 months later and they're like, wow, I should have just listened to you. Right. And it's like, it took that like, I used to hate you because of the videos you would upload about AMC, but now I can see that all you were trying to do was to look out for us. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's all I ever tried to do where I don't care if you trade what it is that I trade. I mean, it makes no difference for me, right? Mm-hmm. My biggest thing is I tried to focus on risk management because while everyone else is trying to focus on how much money they make or how much money they think that you should make, I just want to make sure that you control how much money you give back. Right. And I've seen you made a, a reel or a post, a video, I can't remember, about, because you have the LPP, that's Learn, Plan, Profit. Yep. Right, LPP. And you were you said something that, um, you know, I really listened to it. It was, uh, it kind of said, I don't, I don't want to teach you, I don't want to, we don't teach you how to learn or learn or something else. Uh, that we don't focus on, because I trade live every day. Right. So a big misconception that people have is that they're just going to jump on and try to copy what it is that I do. And it's like, my focus is never to tell you what to do. My focus is to teach you why right. I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. I think that a concept that can be universal and understood by everyone is that in a world full of problems, 
learn to be a problem solver. Right. And I think the big thing is you learn nothing by me showing you that I made $5,000 or $10,000 today. There's no value in that other than it can be motivation. Mm -hmm. But if you can watch me trade live and you can hear my thought process on why I see value in buying, why I see value in adding more to my position or why there's indication of a resistance and why I'm going to lock in profits or if things go south of, hey, this isn't going according to plan, this is why I'm cutting losses. You understand the why behind something. The way and the best way that I can, I would say, try to explain it to your audience is imagine for someone that wants to be in your position and learning how to run a successful dealership, let's say that they know nothing. Right. Imagine them being able to watch you on live auctions every day yeah. Not just seeing and getting a screenshot of all the cars you bought and how much you sold them for, right. but to hear your thought process along the way on why this is a good car, why I'm not buying this car, right. why this might be a good, par, uh, good car, but based off of previous experiences, why you don't want to take that risk. Right. It's mm -hmm. the thought process that actually would be a value for someone that when they're put in a similar position, they can look back and think of the solution that you had to overcome that challenge. Right. And again, it goes back to the concept in a world full of problems, learn to be a problem solver. People pay for solutions. Right. Mm -hmm. You have how many subscribers on the, on the LPP? Uh, we have a couple. Uh, we have, I don't know the exact, I don't There's look a, at it. There's a bunch though. I think I saw on the, on the, um, for the live sessions, we have like two to 3000 people that yeah. tune in live every day. So and you do it every day. Monday through Friday, anytime that the market is open, I'm there. So that's, that's, that's yeah. badass, man. How do you separate yourself from, you know, I mean, day trading as far as like the, the stats that they say, and who knows if the stats are actually true? No, but it, it um, is true. The, the 1% is. Well, is not 1%. Or not, but it's something like, close to. It's yeah, low. It's 90% 90, 90 of people fail. I, I think that anytime that there is a low barrier of entry, it's literally look it up in anything. Did you know that 87% of real estate agents fail? Normally people don't understand that because they're like, well, I thought real estate was a safe way to get started. Yes, but anyone and their mother can become a real estate agent. There's nothing True. special about yeah. it. There's a very low barrier of entry where right. anyone can do it just with trading in the stock market or investing or starting a business. Now everything's become so accessible that learning to become or do anything is so easy to start, which means that it's even easier to give up. Like that, right? And I think that's the big thing where I wish they made it a little bit more challenging to open up a trading account. And this is why, again, when asking of like, okay, well, I want to start to learn how to do something. Should I go the free route and join free forums or go the pay route and join paid and private forums? I think it's very simple. It's ask yourself if you've ever gone to a public event and a private event. The people that are in the private event are most likely to take things more seriously because they've paid to be there. Yeah. So there is a barrier that did act as some form of a restriction that hopefully, in the end it's never perfect, but hopefully they can take it more seriously and that therefore the environment within that community is more supportive for someone that's actually trying to learn how to trade, yeah. not just be another Reddit trader. Right. And then, you know, you'll see those people there week after week and then on the other places, people are always changing. It's like people during New Year's for, <laughs> you know, the gym. It's yeah. the same true. thing. Yeah. It's they have all their specials. Start a new membership. You're gonna see them all of November, all of December. Start your New Year's early, right? Super easy, zero sign up fees. I mean it's a cycle. And then by February to March, did, it's did, gonna be empty. Right. Did you ever have like uh obstacles, some struggles, maybe some times where you felt like quitting or everything just has worked out great? Because obviously we can hear that you're a guy that really studies, really like, you know, get prepares for what's coming, kind of. Yeah. So oh, has it always, have you had a, a bad struggle where you almost lost everything or? Where I've almost lost everything. No, again, uh, one of the things that I've talked about is my job's not to avoid risk. My job's to manage it. I've always been very, um, very focused on calculated risk. Everything that I do, everything that I choose to buy, even with like my time, I'm even with the people that I would spend it with, my relationships, everything was has always, that's just always how I've been wired, where I will not do anything that I do not see the reward to outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. It's very rare, unless if I'm trying to do it for pleasure, or if I'm trying to do it for an experience, then that could be different, right? But no, I have never put myself in a position that I was not able to tolerate. And we talk about that all the time, where if you approach life that way, if you approach the business, if you approach the side hustle, if you approach trading in the stock market, that 
right now that markets are down. Everyone's all like, oh, should I buy? Should I buy? Put yourself in a position that you can tolerate. The question should never be if the markets will recover because we all know based off of history, markets always end up recovering. So right. it's not an if, but it's a when. Yeah. And the simple question to ask yourself is, will you be able to tolerate the time that it will take for the markets to recover? Right. It's when, it's not if. So again, how can you control to be able to tolerate more? The money. Right. Money is what follows or drags drags you down with emotion. If you go in and buy one share of Apple right now at you know 140 a share, doesn't fucking matter if it drops 50%. You bought one share. Yep. The only people that are shitting bricks are the people that are fully in mm -hmm. on Apple and have no more cash reserves to buy, right. right? We talk about position size. We talk about, again, there's just, by focusing so much on the defense, it's kind of like Mayweather. Again, yeah. that's, that's how you can really set yourself up for success. And I, and I try to those concepts that I've learned in the stock market, I know the stock market's not for everyone. I mean, I'm very boring. I'm very, um, it's just how I'm wired and I feel like I just work really well with that market. Um, but I think that if anyone has ever wanted to get started, not so much even to even make money, but those concepts and principles that you learn to become a successful trader or investor, I feel like are universal concepts that will be of value for you in every aspect of life, of starting a business, of you know growing relationships. It, it really puts you in a perspective where, again, some people might not appreciate it, but it, it's a risk to reward. And yeah. Yeah. it might be viewed as a bad thing. Well, there's always something that you're trying to gain. It could be an experience. It doesn't right. have to be a monetary reward. It could be that, you know, I have friends that, I simply like to be around not because of how much money they make or the money that I think that I can make with them. It's I think they're dope people. Right. right? You just so genuinely enjoy being around. Find, finding a balance. And and what uh how did you learn into the stock market? When you got started, was it self taught stuff or were you following other people? How how'd you go Mentors. about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I learned everything through trial and error, um, through what I like to call YouTube University. I, one of my most <laughs> popular videos on YouTube is actually um or again, it was a very common question that I got of, you know, where, how did I learn how to trade? And people think that because I have my course that I want everyone to sign up. And it's like, no, it's very simple. It's, I learned on my own. Right. You can learn literally everything on your own. I can learn how to create a business. I can learn how to start to drop ship. I can learn how to trade on my own. The very simple question I like to remind people is you have two options. You can learn with pain. You can learn with your time. Will... By trying to take, you know, option one of learning based off of experience, which I think is a great route. The only thing that you are going to really kind of hold yourself back on is the time that it will take to learn everything on your own. You can't really learn something that you don't know needs to be learned, right? right. So it's going to take a lot longer and probably the cost is going to be a lot higher to learn on your own. Yeah. But again, that's how I learned and... I'm still always learning new things, right? Yeah. The second option is, then you can not just mine. I don't care if you sign up for mine, but my thing is, regardless of what it is that you want to do, if you've been on edge, it's follow someone and or work with someone that can condense the time that it will take to learn a lot of the mistakes that you're going to make. I feel like that's the way that I would approach it, where would they be of value enough that it will condense the time and that you will learn much quicker, not to try to make money right away, but just so it doesn't cost you as much long term, like, oh, my God, it might be expensive to sign up and pay $500. Well, you can trade with your $50,000 or $10,000 and lose it all. And what ended up being more That's expensive, true. right? Absolutely. 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 That's crazy. That's the great thing about your your uh, the LPP, how like you already went through all that. You know what I mean? So yeah. now you offer them. And they're still going to go through, they're still going to make mistakes. 100%. Sure. But, yeah. you know, a lot of it is you already said, hey, I already did this. Try not to. You know what I mean? So yeah. now we're here. You still always learn best by, at least I do, by your own experiences. Yeah. You know, my parents have always told me of what not to do, but I don't learn to not do it until <laughs> I experience it myself. Yeah. But the biggest thing is that at least you have that type of support and or you're made aware of where you went wrong. And I think that's where that, pro that progress really comes from. Right. You recently became a father too, right? Yeah. How many how, uh, months, right? Just eight months. Eight months. Yeah. How did that change? Did that, did that do any change like in the way of you, the way you see life or did that change anything for you? It's much more intentional for me. So I've always been really big on working mm -hmm. and I felt like that's really what consumed my life. 
And now I've tried, I, I still, again, I have an amazing partner. Her name is Rachel. And she's been of huge value to me in making me realize that like, I need to find this work-life balance where I want to work hard and I want to continue to always do better. And I want to be that, I mean, that, that, that ambition I don't see going away anytime soon, right. but I also need to remind myself of why I'm doing what I'm doing. What's the point of having 12 to 16 hour days if tomorrow I end up dying and I've never experienced or end of was a value to the people that I love most, right? Yes. Especially with my daughter and seeing the past eight months of how quick and how much she's developed. It is insane where, I mean, it's really motivated me to spend more of that quality time, not just with Remy, but, you know, building a stronger relationship with Rachel. And out of every person I've ever met, it took Rachel at that given time in my life to like, I think that's why I've, I've always seen it through with her, mm -hmm. where it was just, she had specific qualities that it wasn't about uh, the looks, it wasn't about what I thought that she could provide for me. As I viewed her as an individual that was so much of value to me, right? That it was someone that I would, you know, um, I can see as a life partner, right? Yeah, that's badass. I know, you know, you mentioned, you know, they grow so quick. Yeah, you remember Mia, yeah. you know, being eight months, right? She's yeah. three now. She's three. She's three now. Looks ten. She looks eight. <laughs> she's big. She's yeah. tall. She's like. Yeah, she's definitely got my height. Yeah. She's really yeah. tall. She's big. Yeah. It's crazy. You do have to have, find the time to enjoy that, you know, because like you said, then why am I doing all this? You know? Yeah. And it's hard because, uh, especially in the world that we live in today, especially I mean, everyone's position is different, right? And we all have our own uh, challenges, but when things are so accessible and you can also, you know, if you have like a social media following or you do well, you feel like you're entitled to something and. Rachel does a great job humbling me uh, yeah. in the sense that, uh, you know, we're equal partners. And even before Remy comes Rachel and I, because without Rachel and I, then Remy doesn't have a foundation right. of a family to build off of. So, again, these were principles that I never thought of that right. I had presented to me and and expressed why they're so important. And again, it took that specific partner at that specific moment in my life to make me realize. And again, right. that's why I think it's um, I'm, I'm very grateful for this unplanned blessing <laughs> that I was given this year. Yeah. Uh, they say the un unplanned things are the best. Yeah, you, know? you have no expectation and all the reward. Yeah, that's badass. A question that, uh, you know, I see it everywhere is, you started with $2,500. Yep. Do you remember the moment you said you hit your first $100,000 or 10000 even or something that you said, okay, damn, you know what I mean? No, because uh, originally my focus was like, uh, trying to break over a million dollars. And it wasn't a million dollars. Um, it was like a million dollars in, in valuation, right? With, I mean, I had properties, I had vehicles and stuff Cars. like that. I was and so assets. in the mix. Yeah, I was so in the mix with what I was doing, with the trading, with the YouTube, with all my different businesses that I think it was like over a month after I looked at my statements of when I actually surpassed a million. And this was a million on paper where I had over a million dollars cash and I didn't even notice um, you were was, how old at the time? Uh, 22. That's crazy, wow. dude. <laughs> <laughs> you got two years, Jaden. You got two years. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's um, it was something that sparked my interest originally of like one day I want to make seven figures or want right. to have seven figures. It's everyone. I mean, I feel like a lot of people have that milestone. Right. But once I saw of what I was doing and, and how possible everything was the amount of opportunities that present itself as your it outweighed the idea of actually or the milestone of making a million yeah. um it outweighed i mean i've never had um or i've never seen a figure where i was just like oh this is it or wow this actually feels good um it's just always been so it's been more of the can i create something it's the challenge that's yeah. always being so young you know with that amount of cash flow at that time you know a yeah. million dollars right now is a lot of money but back then, it was even more money. Yeah, you know, it it was it could buy you a lot more things than what a million dollars could buy you today. Yeah, right. How did you not let that get to your head? You know, I feel like a lot of people now get. You know, I meet a lot of people that have ten, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, and they're just in the in the in the sky. You know, how do you? Yeah. Did, how did how did you handle that? Um, people that were like big inspirations for me were like Warren Buffett and then a lot of like the big tech guys like when I would hear about Mark Zuckerberg or um, you know Elon Musk it was great that I was able to achieve a specific milestone that a lot of people appreciated but I always put 
them into perspective or what other people were doing that had more. And I mean, it's often said that like comparison is often the thief of joy. Right. Uh, but it, it's something that also kept me humble where I, mm-hmm. it then no longer became about the money. It was more about, you know, okay, we're doing well. Um, what's the next milestone? Or we have this project we just completed, um, you know, with like the house flips or with the trading or with the cars and the dealerships and, and selling our first, you know, 100 vehicles and then 1,000 vehicles. Right. It's like those were more rewarding and fulfilling milestones than actually seeing the dollar value. And I think once you get to that position, you can then yeah. s- see it and speak on it. It's like it starts off with wanting it. Right. But then now when you've made everything happen, the journey, just like everyone else says, was so much more rewarding and fulfilling right. than actually hitting it. Because once you hit it, then now you know it's over, right? It's, it's true what you said. Because like for me, it's more of a like, I don't see, you know, obviously I kind of know like what we made that month. Yeah. But I, I look more, okay, how many did we sell that month? And then I try to beat that the next month. Exactly. And it's, it, I don't really look at the, at the profit wise. I kind of just say, okay, we sold... 120. I want to sell 130 this month. Can we do it? You know, yeah. so it's more like the, the challenge. Part, the challenge yeah. yeah. Was there ever um, a point where you were trading where you finally was like, I figured it out? Because I know there's when uh, COVID happened and the market was going down. I remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> I uh, I was shorting. I was shorting the tech stocks as things were going down on the options, and uh, and I kept winning and I kept winning and I kept winning. And I remember I even called my mom and I said, Mom, I got this figured out. Like like I'm good. Like, I don't ever have to work. I could drop in and out right now. I'm solid. <laughs> and then I kept shorting and then things went up and I lost it all. Like that of what I, what I did. Um, but was there a spot in your, your life where you're trading where you're like, you know, I, I have a rhythm and I, you know, I, I understand this now. The biggest thing, um, I mean, I, I can't think back to the exact moment of where everything began to click, but because even now, I mean, I have moments where, um, I think trading is just a little bit different than, um, a business where I even have moments now where I have rough patches that, you know, it's, it's, it's red days after red days and or red weeks, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's market conditions change and therefore they make things more challenging. Uh, I'm always learning more and I'm always hopefully also reminding myself on, on why specific things are so important. Um, I would say back maybe in 2000 and what was it? 2000. 14, 2015, uh, those were specific moments where I was more consistent with it. Mm -hmm. But there was also those experiences that like how you spoke, where you would get so caught up, you would, you would get so high and mighty in the sense of I feel invincible, that you forget to protect your downside. And you've had numerous or months of green trades, but it just takes one solid one to really discourage you. And this is something, you know, the reason that I try to preach risk management so often and so much is because I've experienced it firsthand in every form of way where I love to remind our traders that even at their highest moments, we have this saying within our Learn Plan Profit group of on my green days, I prepare for my red days and on my red days, I prepare for my green days. Mm-hmm. Stock market is doesn't matter how much I made last month, doesn't matter how much I made last week, it doesn't matter how much I made yesterday. If I have no form of risk management, if I have no discipline or no structure, it can literally be taken away, especially yeah. with options. I don't trade options, but <laughs> especially with options, you can lose it like all them. at once. <laughs> I don't yeah. like that. that that's one thing I like about right. Ricky is I've seen you post your red days. Yeah. You know, yeah. obviously I, I, you get like tagged a lot on the people you help that they get, you know, profits and stuff. Yeah. But I've also seen you share your red days. And I yeah. remember you said, hey, don't forget to also share the red days. Yeah. yeah. Prepared, you know. That's, that's nice. What's the? Have you ever lost a big amount of money on that? On yeah, well, define big. Yeah, I've lost a what? decent amount. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most you've lost on a red day? Um, on a day, um, forty five thousand. Forty five thousand. Yeah. That's, on that's TQs, a lot, yeah. which is a triple leverage Nasdaq ETF, where again, uh, it's very easy to now look back and be like, oh, I should have cut losses. And again, the one thing that we talk about is setting stop losses. So if you do take a loss, that it hits your max percentage loss and. It doesn't yeah. matter how much it's down, it just cuts it there. Right. Um, but again, it's I put myself in a, a position where I had a lot of money, and with a lot of money comes a lot of emotion. Right. And when things were going south, I began selling myself the idea that, no, it's going to recover, it's going to recover. And then you go down that never-ending rabbit hole where 
you just end up cutting losses at a much lower price point right. that you wanted to, and then it humbles you once again, right? right. But those are big lessons learned that it, I'm very grateful that I'm, I work in a market where I am reminded how important it is to be consistent because I'm reminded every day. So, have you trained uh, trained your like emotions to where like now where you can enter your your positions and whatnot and like your your heartbeats the same like you're just <laughs> mellow and relaxed and have it drinking your coffee as you go on or, or are you always like laser focused? No, I mean I I control myself. Um, I would say better than the average person. Uh, I mean, my learn plan profit comments on this all the time when they get to see me trade live where, you know, I might be down on a position, but because of how I manage my position size, it doesn't freak me out. To the average person, they're like, oh my God, he has $100,000. Like this thing just dropped 3%. Right. But to me, it's like, well, $100,000 is a, you know, 20% position. And that's all I view it as. So if it is dropping, it's like, if you trade with $1,000, that's like you going in with $200. Yeah. And if it drops 3%, are you going to freak out? It's just, it's all relative to scale. There's a, there's this saying where like, you never become, you never don't become scared. You just become more comfortable being scared. And I think that comes with anything. As you gain experience and you gain confidence, you begin to trust yourself more to a point where you can tolerate those uncertain times. Yeah, Absolutely. But no, it never. I'm never like <laughs> at peace or anything like that. Your, yeah. your palms are sweaty. Yeah, and stuff. yeah I, I still have. I mean, I'm human. I I have moments where you know when the camera's off, I'm cussing. I'm just like, <laughs> like an idiot. Um, and I have my group where I I think it's it's really again another thing that's really um, encouraged me to be more selective and to be harder on myself because I have all these people that are watching me. And by them watching me, I, I need to lead by example. Yeah. And when I don't lead by example, it's not even about the dollar amount that I lost or mistakes that I made. It's more of like, I need to do better for them. Yeah. And yeah. That's um, my essay, what would you say got you into the uh, stock market? Like, was there someone that introduced you to it or? Uh, not someone you... that introduced me to it, but uh, what sparked my interest is, again, I was such a fanboy of cars. My brother, right. one of our bonding moments was he would take me to see Fast and the Furious movies. And I remember seeing and falling in love with That's like when, a Nissan GTR. they were GTR. Super, super popular back in the Yeah, when Paul Walker was, it was too fast, too furious and all yeah. that stuff, right? Tokyo Drift. And those were the experiences that I would experience or um, the moments that I remember with my brother and I remember coming back one day and I was like I want to see how much it costs to buy a GTR right and when I looked it up I was like god damn like it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a hard to be able to afford that with even being an engineer right, right. Uh, I was expected to hopefully as I get a good job as an engineer and make eighty thousand dollars a year I was like dude this car is eighty thousand I was like <laughs> how's that gonna work and then I searched up how to make money online and then there's this guy uh, that came out in this like news article where he made trading lower cap stocks over seven figures um, while he was still in high school. And it's what sparked my interest. It's, again, just like anything, what I hope that I can be for someone where I can spark your interest and in regardless if you end up in the stock market or not, or maybe you start your own business, but I'm the person that just sparked an interest in knowing what is possible. And, and that's what I view that article as. It's, I mean, I've I've started to trade and then I would stop and then I would do different things, but it was that article that showed me that someone young can be successful. Right. And that's always what I've, I've viewed it as. It wasn't that I don't even know that person or that person doesn't even know that they motivated me, but it was just, it put things into perspective that these things are possible. Right. You ever look back at that, you know, you know that uh, you were 18, you said, right? When you came over here? Yeah, yeah you oh, never, 20. 20 you ever look back at that ricky you know with the twenty five hundred dollars to where you are today and just kind of like what would you tell him well like, i told this whole? <laughs> i didn't have i started trading with twenty five hundred dollars oh, i okay. had more than that but oh, yeah, yeah, right. um i see pictures of it all the time because i make a lot of videos so mm -hmm. i look back and i'm it's cringy because like i had braces dude I, if you think <laughs> i'm skinny now i was skinnier back then i was awkward like I'm on camera every day, right? So now my social cues are a lot better. I was monotone. I had no personality. And I wore, I mean, I kind of still wear the same thing every day, but I would <laughs> wear this Tech Buds shirt. I would wear my ASU hat. I would wear a cardigan over. So I'd wear a hat that was a baseball cap with a cardigan. And I would wear my like joggers and these like beat up shoes that I had. And again, it's, that's just who I was. It's, it took a specific, like, I was awkward, I was different, 
Um, I didn't care about what people thought of me. I, I was so focused on my work and wanting to do well that that was my only obsession. Right. Later on, then again, I began to learn more about how people dress or I learned right. more about going out. I never went out until I was 23 years old. Because you got the wrong campus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, never went to a college party, but then going out after I already began to do well, I went out with my boys and they would go out every single weekend. I never went out. I never drank. And then I was 23. I just recently at that time broke up with a girlfriend I had. They're like, dude, you have to come with us. You have to come to Whiskey Row. Mm-hmm. I went with a button up. I went with my cardigan and I went with my ASC hat. That was my fit to go out. Right. And I'm on the edge of the dance floor. All my boys are like smooth guys. Like they're like big and, and you know, they have beers like the <laughs> girls out on the dance floor. And there's my nerdy ass like on the, <laughs> on the corner, like just watching them happen. I, I, I was like, wow, this is why people like the weekends. Like right. I never understood it. Like why do you people enjoy the weekends or want or look forward to the weekends if they can't work? Right. I just never understood it. And then it's like, oh, this is that? it. This, this is, this is it. <laughs> um, and then I started to experience that a little bit more. And, you know, I, I began to develop more as an individual. Do, do you have a, you know, a plan for the future for what it is that, you know, um, and obviously you're growing a lot in the real estate. You know, you started with one flip. Now you're at how many? What was the most you've ever had? Um, this year, this is our first full year flipping. Um, we are at a little bit over 30, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, that's so crazy. for this year. That's, yeah. that's crazy. We have to take another little pause, guys. And then right now, Ricky can tell us a little bit more of his plans of where you see yourself later on. Yeah. You have a plan and stuff. So we'll be right back. All right, guys, we're back. As we were saying, is there anything that you have, like, you know, for the future? What's ahead? Yeah, so, I mean, I, my focus with our businesses is just to continue to grow. I would love to. So we have some things that I'm working on where... Um, I'm really just trying to partner up with people um, that when I really asked myself, I was like, how can I be of value for other people or how can I to continue to grow as an individual or as an entrepreneur? It's my biggest value piece is I feel like I can offer advice and I offer money and then I can offer experience based off of you know the different businesses that we've ran for someone that for me, like let's say like right now there's this candy business. Um, And this candy business is something that I'm going to be buying equity into. And it's something where I like candy. You're like a shark tank. (laughs) It's it's just like little things like that where we also started um, a um, blog. And this Mm -hmm. blog went from getting no traction. So now I get, uh, I think, like 40 to 60,000 visits, uh, unique visitors every single month. And it's like, I never thought I would want one. But, you know, I found someone that is more obsessive and more talented in that area. I was a value for them. I set them up on like the salary and I got equity into it. And I'm thinking of doing the same thing with um, different businesses that I see value in and that I believe in the partner. It's never really so much about the business. It's more of like I'm choosing to invest in the individual because right. at the very beginning, the biggest mistake that you can make when you're just getting started in anything, in my opinion, is if you start something with the sole reason of trying to make money right away, you're not really even giving yourself the chance to right. succeed. Where if I can be a value for them and provide that stability and I already see that obsession on them and they're gifted, I just know that, again, I can provide them that stability so they can approach it in an obsessive way and grow it to a point where no one that's just doing it for the money would have had the willpower or intrinsic motivation to grow it. So that's my focus for growing businesses for my family um, or for like more on the personal side of things. I'd love to continue to grow my relationship and, and build a stronger foundation in that relationship with Rachel. And I mean, we'll see what happens with Remy, maybe some future kids, but yeah. um, we're also just, I'm setting up an investment account for Remy right mm-hmm. now that the markets are down. Um, I think now is the best time to invest long-term. Right. We were talking about it a little bit earlier where we're selecting three to four different stocks. I'm going in with about 75000 That's going to be for her. And um, I mean, they're not crazy companies that you're like, oh, they're, they're super, um, you know, uh, creative or no one knows about it. It's we're investing in Apple, we're investing in Amazon, and we're investing in Tesla. And it's very simple. It's one of the things that I always try to preach. It's when you look back and you look at any previous recession, you always look at it as a missed opportunity. Man, I should have right. bought more. Man, right. you know, I should have been more proactive. Or yes, I knew exactly what I was doing and that's why I am where I am now. But it's any current recession where people view it as too risky of a time to invest. And it's because you can't 
predict the future, right? right? So like I was telling you, my job is not to predict the future. My job is to prepare for it. And I think now is the best time to prepare, especially for my daughter, a good investment account and to get specific stocks that I believe are undervalued right. long term. And we're just keeping it simple, focusing on blue chip companies and, um, you know, hopefully adding like more said, to it's that. Like you said, it's not a matter of if, but when. Exactly. Right. That's really cool that you know, you're already planning something for her. That, yeah. That's bad. Definitely. Man. Is there any advice that you would give? Obviously, I mean, I know in your plan and even on your, you know, on your social media all day, you're always giving advice to people. Is there something that you probably think you left out or something? That My thing is I would want to say, you know, if you've ever had interest in learning how to trade or learning how to invest, you can start for free. First off, there's a bunch of free videos. Second, you can open up a paper trading account. So paper trading is simulation trading. It's fake. I mean, it's fake money. You can Google it, but it allows you to practice. Right now, if you're watching this and you're someone that's really wanted to invest, but you never know in the best time, I just want to use this as a proof of concept. Buy one stock, whatever company you see the most value in that has shown previous history of growth. And right now that it's down, buy one share. Don't overcomplicate it. I don't care how much you could afford. Buy one share. And the reason I'm saying one share is because you're not going to sell that share and you're going to be more willing to tolerate the time that it will take for the market to recover. And then I want you to look back at that percentage growth that it had once the markets do recover. And I want, to you, I want you to use that as your own personal experience that next time that the market drops, how much money you could have made if you would have gone in with 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. Right. I mean, there's companies like Apple. Apple is one of the most valuable companies that's publicly traded. Right now it offers 30% ROI. 30% for one share at 140. I mean, you're not gonna make very much. You're gonna make about $40 a share if that. But 30% for, Ten thousand, three thousand dollars. That's right. not bad. A hundred thousand, thirty thousand. A million, three hundred thousand. And guess what? Did you invest in this crazy lucrative opportunity? No, you did it with Apple, which is one of the most valuable companies. But you did it during a time that was worth investing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that would be my biggest thing: is it stop overcomplicating, to stop thinking of how much money you should do it with. Just buy one share. Prove it to yourself. I'm big on proving it to yourself first, so you then understand why it's worth doing it the next time the markets sell off because no one should ever convince you to do something. You should feel comfortable enough taking advantage of an opportunity or taking that risk. That's, yeah, that's, that's a really good advice, man, honestly. Yeah. You're inspired? <laughs> You're inspired? Yeah, you have to start somewhere. You don't. I, I wanna do, uh, Jaden, to start, I, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, this is me for you, I'm gonna give you $2,500 as a gift. I'm making this public, so I'll give you that today. And that way you can start whatever you want to invest in. Hopefully he motivated more. You want to join join uh, his uh, LPP some yeah. whatever. Uh, you can do that too. But that's my way of kind of like helping you. Oh, so I'm, I'm, grateful. Grateful. I'm grateful. Very grateful. What's a uh, good stock? I mean, stock to invest in as a first timer. As a first timer, I would say just because of where conditions are right now. Uh, I would say Apple or Amazon. They're as bulletproof of a company as they can get. Amazon, um, again, in my opinion, is not going anywhere anytime soon. It has its tentacles in too many different areas that it's making money. It's literally a, a cash cow. Google, same thing. Um, I would almost not stray away, but if you wanted to be more risky, maybe you can get into Facebook or now they're called Meta because now they're trying to develop the metaverse. Right. That could be a very lucrative opportunity, but also something that might not ever go back to previous highs if the metaverse doesn't end yeah. up paying off. There's Tesla, you know, yes, it's a great company, but also a little bit more risky because it's still like an emerging market, right? I would say the main three or the main four would be Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Yeah. I don't like to overcomplicate it. I just want to keep things simple. I want someone that's been on the border, on the edge of wanting to start, just to buy one share, right. just one. And I think, um, this isn't something more so for me, but I think some viewers, I'm sure will get uh, asked this, is uh, do you dabble at all with cryptocurrencies and those offside things, or are you just solid stocks? Because, I mean, if you're doing good there, you might as well just, you know. I do have cryptocurrency. Um, I do not, I, I, I view it as when markets are down, I view it as a long-term play. I don't day trade. I don't do any of that with any crypto. I buy during downtimes and I sell as it's going up. I never sell at all-time highs. I always sell early. My big thing is it's short-term pain for long-term gain. And that's how I view crypto where 
it's not that I believe in it or I don't believe in it. I do not care. I just, I know eventually it tends to recover and yeah. I do it with a dollar amount that I can tolerate. So even if I were to lose it all, it's not something that would make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But it's a very lucrative mm-hmm. market for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Crypto. I mean, I've seen a lot of people really blow up, you know, Yeah. it's crazy. Ricky, man, honestly, you know, for me is like now hearing like your backstory, the Latino, like the Hispanic part of it, I didn't know that. That's even more inspiring, you know, and I'm sure you inspired a lot of the viewers now. Um, that's really, you know, something to really look up to, man. That's amazing. I appreciate it, oh boy. Yeah, thank no, you. It's really amazing, man. Um, thank you for coming. We know it's a long drive for you. You know, it's a lot. It's late right now, and it's a long drive back. I got like 40 minutes to go up. So it's, it's a little far. Um, thank you for being here, man. It really means a lot. Um, again, like I said earlier, I know. I'll, Getting, we're barely starting, so getting someone that's already big in the YouTube and all this, and with your success, it's a, it's a little hard. Yeah. I really appreciate you actually, you know, being humble and taking your time to do so. It really course, means a man. lot, man. Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it, guys. We appreciate you here. Well, there you have it, guys. There's Ricky Gutierrez, and so make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. There's about seventy percent of you guys that haven't. <laughs> the same this the too. Analytics, yeah. um, and then drop a like if you guys liked it. Comment down below anything else that you want to hear or anybody that you guys want us to put on, and uh, we'll see you guys on that next one. For sure. Have a good one.